Silent Hill 2 is a game which needs no introduction, and I certainly hope that you don't need an introduction to it either. This video will contain spoilers, and if you do not already have a basic understanding of the game, you're gonna be lost. Of course, Silent Hill 2 fan theories on the internet are nothing new, nothing special. So, do I have anything special or new to offer? I certainly hope so. I myself have learned a lot from the research that went into this video. And so might you. To be clear, I am not saying that what I am going to present here is the only true way of reading the game. I strongly believe that the story of Silent Hill 2 has polyvalence, meaning that there are multiple layers of meaning, and what I am about to present may just be only one of these possible layers. This video will contain on-screen texts for additional information. These are optional, but if you wish to get all the details, you may occasionally pause the video to read them. So what is this video going to be about? Well, as you could already tell from the title, this is going to be a religious video. A very religious video. I will discuss quite a range of fields, from Judaism to Shintoism and a little bit of Greek mythology, but the bulk of this video will be a Catholic interpretation of Silent Hill 2. If that is nothing for you, I can only appeal to your openness, and let me assure you, I did not try to read my own biases into the game. Sure, that's ultimately unavoidable, but what I mean is, making a religious analysis of this game originally was not even my plan. But as I found more and more evidence against my initial convictions, I had to conclude that the game is just rife with religion, with Catholic religion, and that I should share these conclusions. Over the course of this video, I will present and explain the dream theory which led the foundation for this whole video, the chiastic structure of Silent Hill 2's narrative, further conclusions regarding Pyramid Head, the surprising connection between Pyramid Head and Laura, how Mary relates to the elusive nurse Rachel, the purgatorial state James is in, how he gets out of that state, connections to Dante's Divine Comedy, and the game's endings. So let us begin. I used to think, and I still somewhat think, that whenever James meets Eddie or Angela in the second half of the game, they are only projections of his own tendencies towards murder and suicide. I find Eddie's whiplash-inducing character arc just much more believable if later Eddie is simply James's mind using this uglier James lookalike as an image of James's own uglier side. Eddie and James are the same. Both of them are the pig, a New Testament idiom for a stubborn sinner. Okay, that's all quite possible, not too far-fetched, but why did I think that this would specifically pertain to the second half of the game? Well, because the second half is a dream or a nightmare. This dream starts when James falls unconscious in the hospital, after which the game turns much darker and dirtier and far more surreal. Or maybe that is just where James enters a deeper dream nested inside a larger dream. But it is not just a dream. The game's North American subtitle is Restless Dreams. The game's Japanese subtitle translates to Poem of the Last Moment. Combine both themes and you get what Shakespeare famously discussed as follows. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream? Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. The game, and its second half in particular, might just be that Shakespearean kind of dream which may come in the sleep of death. For that, I've got three points of potential evidence. Point 1. All the other games in the original quadrilogy, and especially their other worlds, which here starts with James's syncope, are about wandering through someone's nightmarish dreamscape, so it is just obvious that this should apply to Sound Hill 2 as well. 
Point 2. A few lines in the game imply some sort of dream or nightmare. There is an inscription which reads, The door that wakes in darkness, opening into nightmares. This door opens after James's syncope, when all is dark. A little while later, a memo hidden in an easily missable spot in the prison reads, And such trifling dreams they have, flourishing even in the darkness. This is about prisoners, and a later chapter in this video will explain what prisoners have to do with the realm of the dead. And leading up to the leave ending, James will say, I understand now. It's time to end this nightmare. A line which, as it appears only in the leave ending, will make even more sense towards the end of this video. Point 3. This is where it gets really interesting, because it led to the foundation for all the rest of what I am going to discuss in this video. There are several lines of dialogue and events in the first half of the game which are repeated in the second half. For example, there's a repetition of the incident where James encounters Laura with a letter, she mentions Mary, runs off and James runs right after her, and in both scenes there is a drawing of a cat. And the repetitions don't end there. There's a repetition of Eddie's speech pattern. There's a repetition for the model used for the corpse legs nearby. There's a repetition of the line, how do you know about that? There's a repetition of the line, I wonder if it's still there, both relating either to the hotel or something in it. There's a repetition of the accusation that James hated Mary or didn't want her around anymore. Not the same line verbatim, but similar themes. There's a repetition of the accusation of someone being a liar. First, James accuses Laura of being a liar. Later, Angela and Laura accuse James of being a liar. Last but not least, there is the repetition of a fight against a caged boss enemy, which marks the end of both the first and the second half. Such repetitions of things that have been heard or said or seen before is a very typical phenomenon in dreams. As a matter of fact, that is what dreams are made of. So, the fact that this element is present in Silent Hill 2 can be taken as a clear indicator that the second half is indeed a dream, or maybe a deeper dream inside a dream. What you may also notice is that most of the listed elements in the second half are echoing events from the first half in the very same order. Not all of them, but most of them. This is called a parallelism. While finding narrative structures is nice, one may ask, how is it relevant? Well, the repetitions in the second half don't end there. But the other repetitions that I have found do not fit into a parallel structure. So is the rest of the repetitions just a random mess? Quite the contrary, they merely follow a different structure, namely a chiasmus. What is a chiasmus? Let me give you an example. The last will be first and the first will be last. That is a chiasmus, but a very short and simple one. Chiasmus means that elements of a text are repeated in a mirrored order. You can see that each layer has the same theme on both ends. These themes are mirrored around a specific center point X, which can often be the climax of a story, because a chiastic structure can also be applied to a bigger narrative. For example, part of my master's thesis was about a chiasmus in and around the biblical story of the woman taken in adultery to prove its textual authenticity. So you can imagine, I'm really into chiasmi. With that explained, let us return to Silent Hill 2 and how its chiasmus stretches across the entire plot. 
I will work my way down layer by layer, starting with what I perceive to be the central climax, namely the syncope into the other world, that is, when James falls unconscious in the hospital. If that syncope into the other world dreamscape is the central climax of the chiasmus, then the next layer of the chiasmus is James shouting, Open up! just like in the second half with him once again shouting, Open up! and only moments later he sees Laura running off, just like he encountered her moments before the preceding event. But that's a bit complicated, more on that later. One layer below that in the chiasmus, James falls down a hole, passively, pushed by Pyramid Head. While in the second half, James is falling down several holes, actively, by his own doing. One layer further down, James meets Eddie in a pretty normal state at first. But later on that same chiastic layer, James meets Eddie again, but now as a complete psycho. Then, on the layer below that, James first says to Maria, I wonder if it's still there, concerning the hotel. Later on that same layer, it is Maria who says to James, I wonder if it's still there, regarding the videotape in the hotel. One more layer below, Pyramid Head appears with his big knife. Later on that layer, Pyramid Head appears again but this time without his big knife. It is yet one more layer below that, just like James had taken Angela's knife earlier, he would now take Pyramid Head's big knife later on that same layer. A layer below that, James's second encounter with Angela takes place, just like his penultimate encounter with her later on this layer and both encounters are about family issues, his and hers. On the next layer, James meets Eddie both the first and the last time. Both encounters are about murder in one way or another. First, James merely assumes Eddie to be a murderer. Later. James realizes that he himself is a murderer, namely that of the by then truly murderous Eddie. And in both cases, it is quite likely that James will have read about the serial killer Walter Sullivan in the newspaper or on the gravestone shortly before encountering Eddie. Next layer, we see a corpse that looks suspiciously like James, slumped over in an armchair in front of a TV with static. And later on that same layer, we see James himself, slumped over in an armchair in front of a TV with static. One layer below that is where James meets Laura, for both the first and the last time. Another layer below that, in the first half, James acquires the flashlight found on Mary's dress. Later on that same layer, while in Mary's hotel room and afterwards, the flashlight dies. That happens during the cutscene with James and Laura. Try to toggle the flashlight before the cutscene, you'll get no message. Try to toggle it after the cutscene and James will say that it no longer works. Next layer, James can hear Mary's voice on the radio. First, only a few words drowned out by the static noise, but now, towards the end, he can hear her clearly. The next layer is where James meets Angela for the first and the last time. Both scenes include imagery of death. First a cemetery with gravestones, and later the fires of purgatory as a stairway to heaven. A layer below that, we get the very first and the very last red safe point in the entire game. The next layer is James going down some stairs at the start of the game, and then 
At the end of the game, James is going up some stairs. And now we have reached the ultimate final layer of the chiasmus. Mary. At the start of the game, we get to hear Mary's letter. But at the beginning, we only get the beginning of Mary's letter. Later, at the end of the game, we hear Mary's letter once again, and now, at the end, we get to hear it till the end. But there is more. At the start of the game, James is standing nearby his car, which may possibly contain Mary's corpse, and James is looking over the lake. To some degree, these elements also occur in all of the game's proper endings, and no, I am not counting any joke endings. Take the lake. That one appears in all endings. The Maria ending has both this very same overview from the beginning, as well as Rosewater Park as outlooks over the lake. The leaf ending shows a tiny tongue of the lake reaching into the graveyard. The rebirth ending takes place on the lake. And the in water ending even takes place inside the lake. Mary herself can only be seen in the rebirth ending, implying that she may have been in the trunk before. The car with the trunk she's likely in is seen in the Maria ending and, albeit only heard, is present in the in water ending. Only the leave ending where James is freed from the need of Mary's forgiveness by her own bidding has no hint of either the car or Mary's corpse. Other corpses are of course present beneath the earth, and it could be argued that if James were to continue on his path, he would arrive back at his car with Mary in it. But I don't think that that is where his path will lead him, which I will explain towards the end of this video. So there you have it. The entire plot of Silent Hill 2 is one big chiasmus. Of course, not every single thing will fit into a chiastic structure. And one of the things that outright defied the chiastic structure was, oddly enough, one of the most prominent figures in the entire game. The very first time that I personally had ever heard of a chiasmus was in a Bible-related article which explained and presented some chiastic structures in the Old and New Testament, and this article spoke of them as hidden pyramids of the Bible. And with that in the back of my mind, at one point it just suddenly struck me. Silent Hill 2's plot is a chiasmus. Silent Hill 2's red thread is a pyramid. A red pyramid thread. A red pyramid thread? Like, like that red pyramid head? Was I just getting too excited over a silly little pun? Or had I stumbled upon something bigger? Which brings up the question, is the idiom of the red thread also a thing in Japan? Oh yes, but it means something entirely different. In Japanese, the red thread is called Akai Ito, but rather than binding together the narrative of a coherent plot, the Akai Ito is binding together those who are destined for one another, especially in regards to marriage. It is thus called Red Thread of Fate and even the Red Thread of Marriage. And there is a deity in charge of marriages watching over this Red Thread of Marriage. A thread which, so they say, shall never ever 
be severed. And yet James has severed it the day he murdered Mary. Till death do us part. I believe that Pyramid Head is that particular deity that watches over the Akai Ito, the Red Thread, and he is now punishing James for having dared to sever it, punishing him for having broken his bond of marriage with Mary. For this reason, he is depicted as wearing a red pyramid. The red thread of the plot is a pyramid, so the deity representing the red thread of fate and marriage severed by James, which is the overarching theme of the story, appears with a red pyramid on his head. But. His head can easily distract from a far subtler detail. His fingers. For one, his little finger is sticking out. But why? In Japan, the red thread is often believed to be bound to the little finger. So maybe that's why he's accentuating it. But what about the finger right next to it? Have you ever noticed the odd shape of his gloves? Yubitsume is the Yakuza practice of chopping off a segment of the little finger as a debt for an offense one has committed. Now Pyramid Head's little finger is fully intact, but Yubitsume has been applied to his ring finger. His ring finger. You know, the one on which you wear your wedding ring? Marriage? This Yubitsume ring finger is a reference to an offense against marriage, and that there is a debt to be paid for it. James killed his wife. He broke the marriage bond. He severed the red thread of marriage. It all fits like a glove like an oddly shaped glove. So here's the obvious. Woodside Apartments' third floor is above its second floor, which in turn is below the third floor. Big shocker, I know. But why am I telling you this? Well, there is the ancient saying, as above, so below. As a hermetic principle, this aphorism can mean that heavenly things of the astral plane above are in some way reflected in what's going on in the lower regions, be it the world, or maybe even the underworld. Union in duality, two opposites together as one. The notion of union, of oneness, is specifically mentioned in the Emerald Tablet from which the aphorism has been derived. So the entirety of the maxim should rather go, as above, so below, and both are one. With this understanding in mind, we can now return to good old Woodside Apartments. So what happens above, on the third floor? James has his first encounter with Laura who, emerging from the washing room, runs around the corner where James loses sight of her. He is unable to follow her directly. However, James can walk up to the very same corner one floor below, and once he reaches that spot, the scream of a child can be heard from down the corridor around that corner. Just like Laura had done one floor above, now James goes down the corridor as if to follow her route one floor below. But what he finds is not a little girl, but instead Pyramid Head, glowing all red. Both Laura and Pyramid Head are first met behind bars, but those above are straight and orderly, while those below are crooked and chaotic, like heaven and hell. To really drive the point home, this heaven and hell imagery becomes even more obvious from what we will get to see next, when James enters room 208, 
In this room, James finds his own dead body, brutally murdered, and he utters, Oh my god, who could have... Prompting us, the player, to ask ourselves the same question, and most of us will immediately connect this crime scene to the only culprit nearby, the suspicious monster we've just seen right outside the room. Which would of course imply that Pyramid Head must have come through here, having taken care of that poor James guy in the armchair. But if this is the hellish below version, then what is the heavenly counterpart above? You already know the counterpart to this scene. It is, of course, later in the hotel, a scene which does take place on the third floor, above, albeit in a different time and place. Hey, maybe it's just symbolism, or maybe it's timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly. Anyway, remember what happens next? Laura enters the room to take care of this poor Jamesy guy in the armchair. By the way, take note of that mountain painting in the background. Mountains are, pretty universally, a religious symbol for heaven, further implying that this is the above counterpart to that previous scene. And just like in that previous scene where Pyramid Head most probably came through to take care of that room's poor James guy in the armchair, albeit in a somewhat more morbid sense, it is now Laura's turn to do that and then leave this room. That being said, we don't actually see Laura going through the same door she used to come in. Is that important? Probably not, but by now I think that anything's possible with this little girl. You'll see why. Maybe the game is hinting at her having found some other way through which she could leave the room, even if just symbolically. After all, in the previous scene, the below counterpart, James was forced to leave the room not through the same door, but through a clock puzzle. Through a time puzzle. Things are about to get timey-wimey. Could it be that behind the clock Pyramid Head is still lingering around in the area? Nah, he's gone. Gone up to the upper floor having a good time with two... Wait a second. Pyramid Head? Above? Not below? Did he just break the whole as above, so below theme? Well, this is where the game bends time and space to flip the idea on its head. Which brings us back to the later hotel scene, where James, implicitly following Laura, leaves the room and the above counterpart has turned into a below version. And this path does not lead him to Laura, but to Pyramid Head. It's even two of them. But more importantly right now, they're glowing red, as if to mirror the first encounter before Room 208. Or rather, the expected encounter which did not take place after Room 208, now actualized on the other side of the chiastic narrative. That is implied by the subtler but similar red glow. After all, the second encounter does not have any red lights. The rest of the encounters after the apartment segment never show him directly appearing in a red light. Two of these encounters have red lights nearby, but Pyramid Head does not enter these scenes with the red light on himself. So, the last encounter mirrors the first encounter. The only other scene which has Pyramid Head with a red light on himself is the first close combat encounter. The other first encounter, if you will, which also is connected to the other first encounter with Laura. Oh yeah, let's talk about that. The final fight against Pyramid Head really combines all three of the first encounters into one, as the two versus one theme is mirrored by the infamous mannequin scene in Woodside 307, a scene which is peculiar because you might expect to find Laura there in that area, but find Pyramid Head in her stead. After the Blue Creek boss fight, Pyramid Head leaves the room and James runs right after him down the street, right on the heels of Pyramid Head, running into... Laura? Okay, that's odd enough already. And the oddities don't end there. 
just listen to their first conversation. What's a little girl like you doing here anyway? Huh? Are you blind or something? What a weird thing to say, as if it were obvious what a little girl like her is doing here. Is it about the letter she's reading? Possible, but the cutscene's framing totally fails to establish that there even is a letter. The camera was closer in a discarded beta cutscene, but even then, the letter was barely visible. So what is that obvious thing that James is blind towards? Well, maybe it's not about what a little girl is doing here. Maybe it's about what a little girl is doing here. Maybe she is suggesting that James is blind towards her true nature, and that it should be obvious to him and to us, the players, that he just ran after Pyramid Head, but then ran into Laura. Not unlike before, when he followed Laura's path one floor below, but instead ran into Pyramid Head who seems to have been on the same path as Laura. As above, so below. So far, we have only looked at the first few and the last encounters with Laura and Pyramid Head. But remember, the story has a chiastic structure. Depending on the angle at which you depict a chiasmus, it can also have as above, so below. But what about the central climax where above and below meet? At this point, it is important to understand two more things about how a chiasmus can work. First, the elements mirrored in a chiasmus do not need to be equivalents. They can also be opposites sharing one theme, like up and down, hot and cold. Second, multiple chiasmi can overlap within the same narrative, so there can be different chiasmi on top of one another. And both of these things come together in the story's climax. First, James sees Pyramid Head on the hospital roof. Then he falls down. He shouts, open up, with Laura behind the door. Then the climax, the syncope happens. Then he shouts, open up, with Pyramid Head behind the door. He drives up and he sees Laura in the street. In some obscure and mysterious way, these chiastic mirror images connect Laura with Pyramid Head. Throughout the chiastic narrative, the two of them switch roles. Remember the heavenly mountain painting in the hotel room I've mentioned? I think it's the monastery at Mount Sinai, four more paintings of which are in the restaurant of the same hotel. In both of these rooms we meet Laura. An encounter with whom, as you may recall, would be expected in Woodside 307. But there we found Pyramid Head and another painting of Mount Sinai. So what's the connection between the two? I can only come to one conclusion. This is Pyramid Head. This is Laura. This is Pyramid Head. And this is Laura. Both Laura and Pyramid Head are two sides of the same coin. But how can that be, I hear you ask? Well, it could be connected to Kijo in Japanese folklore. To quote an article from Vice... Great source, I know. To quote an article from Vice... One of the reoccurring elements in Japanese mythology is the concept of shapeshifters, kijo, of demons that appear to be women, but are either only half women or use a young and beautiful girl as a facade for something far more sinister. So that theme is deeply rooted in Japanese culture, and we are talking about a Japanese game. However, I don't think that we are dealing with shapeshifters per se. I rather think Jacob's Ladder, one of Silent Hill 2's primary sources of inspiration. If you're frightened of dying and then you're holding on, you'll see devils tearing your life away. If you've made your peace, then the devils are really angels freeing you from the earth. It's just a matter of how you look at it, that's all. The devils are really angels. It's just a matter of how you look at it. 
That should not come as a surprise. Biblically, all the devils, all the demons are indeed angels. Both are of the same nature, except the devils have a fallen nature, from above to below. Next, let us not forget that the word demon originally could mean anything from a neutral spirit to an evil devil to a good angel and even your own conscience. And Japanese kami terminology is famously ambiguous as to the nature or the goodness of a particular deity. And remember, Pyramid Head is a deity, a kami watching over the red thread, the Akai Ito. So to get back to the Jacob's Ladder quote about the devils really being angels, is Pyramid Head a devil? Well yes, Pyramid Head is explicitly called a devil, the red devil. At least that was the original implication before Silent Hill 4 came along. So if the devils are really angels, then Pyramid Head is really Laura, and Laura is really an angel. It's just a matter of how you look at it. Two sides of one coin, two persons in one being. Part of me likes to think of it as a hypostatic union, like the Trinity, kind of. But I would rather compare it to the higher self. Nowadays, a popular New Age belief, the Higher Self, has also been found in various forms throughout Christianity, Islam, Buddhism and Hinduism. The Higher Self is believed to be a mundane individual's connection to the Divine. One form this belief can take is that a person on the earth below has a duplicate in the heavens above. Kind of like parallel timelines where everything has an inverted mirror image. It is in such a sense that I think both Laura and Pyramid Head are the same deity, punishing James for his sin of having severed the Akai Ito. But Laura is the deity's higher self. Pyramid Head is the deity's lower self, because Laura was on the apartment's third floor, above and Pyramid Head was her equivalent on the floor below. As above, so below. And both are one. A common symbol to illustrate this maxim is the hexagram, as shown here on screen. And what a perfect symbol it is. Two triangles, one of them pointing up from below, the other pointing down from above. And both of them are intertwined as one united shape. These two triangles can symbolize a whole range of dualities, but let us focus on one, the masculine and the feminine. The masculine is symbolized by the one pointing up, the feminine by the one pointing down. I am pretty sure I don't have to explain why. Of course, we all know the color for boys is a light blue and light red or pink is reserved for girls. Except, traditionally, that was the other way around. Traditionally, red, be it light or strong, was the color of men, the color of a hot temper. While a light blue, the color of a clear sky, was the color of girls, like the Virgin Mary in traditional art. So, the masculine triangle pointing up from below is red like a certain pyramid head. And the feminine triangle pointing down from above is blue like the dress of a certain girl. Laura and pyramid head intertwined as one form are perfectly represented by the hexagram, to which belongs the ancient saying, as above so below, and the devils are really angels. But let us return to this pretty little shape. Up until now I have referred to it as a hexagram, which is correct, but it also is the Star of David. 
a symbol in Judaism, which leads us to the Bible. Many like to think of Sound Hill 2 as the least religious entry to the original Sound Hill quadrilogy, because it does not heavily focus on a particular local cult. <clears throat> the Order! However, this game is heavily inspired by a movie that is just drenched in religious symbolism, Jacob's Ladder, the title of which is taken from a scene in the Hebrew Bible where Jacob has a vision of God and his angels before continuing on his path and meeting his future wife, Rachel. Who's Rachel? Glad you're asking, James. Let me tell you about Rachel. Rachel was the most beloved wife of Patriarch Jacob, and is thus the ultimate matriarch of Judaism, the last mother of the tribes of Israel. And yet, for years she was unable to conceive children, which contributed to throwing her husband Jacob into a deep depression. Only by the will of God was she eventually able to bear him two sons, and it was during her second child's birth that she died. In the Jewish mind, Rachel is the quintessential mother, and for all intents and purposes among the Hasidim, the Jewish saints. In fact, she is considered a saint in the Catholic Church as well. Saint Rachel the Matriarch. While saints in the Catholic Church are venerated as intercessors and associated with miracles, the same is usually not the case when it comes to Jewish practice regarding the Hasidim. Except for Rachel. Around Rachel and her tomb a practice of veneration has developed, at the very least over the past few decades. Pilgrims of all Abrahamic faiths have visited Rachel's tomb, often in hope for her miraculous intercession to help women who have trouble conceiving a child, so that, by God's will, their wombs eventually shall be blessed with fruit, just like Rachel's. What is most peculiar in this regard is a particular kind of object used in this practice, namely, a red thread. When Jewish pilgrims bring a red thread to Rachel's tomb, they believe that this red thread is being sanctified with a miraculous power that grants a woman to whom they bring this sanctified red thread a child. Hmm, could there be some connection between this red thread and the red thread of marriage in Japanese folklore? Wikipedia says, no. Except, if you consult the Japanese Wikipedia page, which does include an additional paragraph highlighting how red threads play a role in faiths all around the world, with a focus on Judaism and Rachel's tomb. You would be forgiven to think that only a silly gaijin like me would see a connection there, but nope. It's the Japanese who see a connection, even if the traditions may be of different origins. So why all this talk about the Biblical Rachel? Well, I think Silent Hill 2's Rachel is, in fact, the Biblical Rachel. They're one and the same person. Wanna read it? But don't tell Rachel, okay? Who's Rachel? She was our nurse. I took it from her locker. This has always been so weird to me. Sure, it's not unrealistic, but it's weird writing. Why just casually throw around names of seemingly unimportant characters and then have the protagonist draw attention to it by explicitly asking about that seemingly unimportant character? Why shine such a distracting spotlight on Rachel, her name, her role as their nurse, and her having kept a letter addressed to Laura? Why all this information and attention in a scene that has nothing to do with any of that. Because it has so much to do with it. If this Rachel is indeed a saint ranking higher than both Mary and Laura. So what is a saint? 
In Christianity, the spirits of those gone before us go to heaven to worship, pray and mediate. They can be asked for guidance, help and intercession. Too Catholic for your taste? Well then, in Shinto belief, the spirits of those gone before us go to the plane of high heaven to worship, pray and mediate. They can be asked for guidance, help and intercession. Hmm, sounds familiar. Call it Catholic, call it Shinto, Western or Japanese, both have saints. The game heavily implies that Mary has gone to heaven, which means she is a saint. Not unlike Saint Rachel the Matriarch, who is a saint in heaven as well, albeit one of much higher status. Furthermore, in Christian theology, human saints in heaven are ranked higher than the angels. So Laura would be subordinate to both Rachel and Mary. Okay, but how can Rachel the Saint and Rachel from the game be the same person when Laura clarifies She was our nurse. See, a nurse, not a saint. Well, what is a nurse? A caregiver, a protector, overseer, assistant, guide, healer and mediator. So nurse is simply code for saint, and she is their nurse, a saint to whom both Mary and Laura are subordinate. But hey, Rachel must be a literal nurse, right? I hear you say, a literal nurse for literal patients, and Laura says that she too was a literal patient at the hospital, doesn't she? Well no, she doesn't. All she's saying is... I was friends with Mary. We met at the hospital. Met at the hospital. You mean like people encountering angels at their deathbed? Happens all the time. Laura's line makes perfect sense, especially if she is an angel and Rachel a saint. So what's the connection between this saint and this angel in particular? Wouldn't you know it? The red thread. Saint Rachel is associated with red threads which enable women to conceive and bear children. Laura is associated with the red thread of marriage, the end result of which traditionally are children. Both Rachel and Laura work towards the same goal, taking care of people's marriages and that their marriages be fruitful. But that is only Laura's role because she is pyramid head. But then, why does his chamber contain literal abortion tools? Here is one possibility. In Japan, women who have had an abortion will often bring offerings to a temple and pray that its deity will guide the soul of the child in the afterlife. Mind you, this deity has nothing to do with the red thread, they are not the same. But it comes to show that it would be a very Japanese idea that kamis take care of aborted children or stillborn children. Are these abortion tools? Or maybe tools for stillbirth removal, to take care of those fruits of marriage that were less fortunate. Peace be upon them. Stillbirth is the more probable theme here. Pyramid Head and Laura are one deity that contains both masculine and feminine, comparable to the divine hermaphrodite in alchemy. This concept, called rabies, is associated with a square and a triangle, four and three. Pyramid Head is, obviously, associated with the pyramid, which is the triangle, which is three. The square represents the number 4, and Pyramid Head has only 4 fingers, a very sensitive topic in Japan. So, Pyramid Head represents both 4 and 3 combined, just like the rabies, which is classically illustrated as putting the numbers 4 and 3 together. You've probably heard of Japan's tetraphobia. The number 4 is quite seriously considered a number of bad luck in Japan. Because in Japanese, it sounds like the word for death. Guess what? In Japan, especially in their maternity wards, the number 43 is considered just as bad, if not even worse, because Shizan, the numbers 4 and 3 combined, sound just like stillbirth. 
akin to the alchemical rebis. Pyramid head represents 4 plus 3 combined, which in Japan means stillbirth. So, that is probably the purpose which the tools in his chamber serve. Stillbirth removal, implying that miscarriage is one of the themes the game is dealing with. And this topic of miscarriage, surprisingly enough, leads us back to Mary. What is her connection to Saint Rachel? Let's compare the two side by side. Both of them are saints, we have established that already. But just like Rachel, Mary was unable to conceive a child. Laura's letter says that Mary wished to adopt a child, which heavily implies that she may have been unable to produce children herself. The tools in Pyramid Head's chamber might hint at a miscarriage, if they are indeed tools for stillbirth removal. Next, Jacob's depression, and how it is mirrored by James's depression. James, of course, suffered from sexual frustration. Which is such a stale meme, as if you just go kill your wife because you're pissed you can't get laid anymore. Sure. But it is so much deeper than that. If you truly wish to spread your genes just to find out that the loved one to whom you've bound yourself will never be able to give you that, well, I'm not saying that you should get depressed, but if you get depressed about it, it's understandable if you get frustrated with a life because the reproduction thing just didn't... Oh... I guess it is a sort of sexual frustration. Just of a very different kind, yeah. Sexual frustration, okay. And since we're already talking about James, Mary is the wife of James. You may ask, what does that have to do with wife of Jacob? Very simple. The name James has the same etymological root as Jacob. The two names are basically variations of one another. So Mary being married to a quasi-Jacob, who became depressed, and unable to bear children herself, may have identified with Saint Rachel the matriarch and made Rachel her own personal patron saint. So, both Mary and Laura are connected to Saint Rachel, a saint to whom both of them are subordinate, and their primary tasks as saints and angels are intercession and the delivering of messages. Like Mary's letter addressed to Laura, which reads, Please, give him a chance. Another one of those things that have always struck me as odd. Why is Mary telling Laura to give him a chance? Did Mary know that the two would meet in Sound Hill? Or ever at all for that matter? Did she mean that Laura should give him a chance to let him adopt her like Mary herself would have adopted Laura? Although Mary never seems to have discussed the matter with James, since James doesn't seem to have known of Laura before? It is all so odd. But it makes perfect sense if James is in purgatory. Wow, how original. Never heard that one before. I know, I know. The idea of Sound Hill as purgatory is nothing new, nothing groundbreaking. But does the game itself actually indicate that it is about purgatory? I want to show some of the subtle and easily missable details which lend credence to that notion. But first, catechesis. There is so much misinformation on this specifically Catholic doctrine, so let's make clear what purgatory is and isn't. Purgatory is a state that your departed soul is in. Purgatory is not a place, or not necessarily. Purgatory is the final purification, Latin purgare means to purify. The Bible says nothing unclean will enter heaven. Purgatory prepares your soul for heaven. Purgatory is not hell, where the damned spend eternity. Anyone who is in purgatory will go to heaven. No one in purgatory can go to hell. 
Purgatory is temporal punishment. Hell is eternal punishment. Purgatory will end after an individual time span, primarily depending on your sins. It is not endless, not an infinite loop. The time span can be shortened by other people's offerings and prayers for you. You are not alone in the process. Purgatory is associated with metaphysical flames. These are not the flames of hell. However, the strength of the suffering one will endure in purgatory is equivalent to the strength of suffering one would endure in hell. So it is very possible that what looks and feels like hell really is just purgatory. So much for the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. But what about Shintoism? From what I have read, the souls or spirits of the departed may go to heaven, or rather the Tama goes to Takamanohara, and some seem to believe that the time span to get there would depend on the Tama's purity. An impure Tama may take years to get to Takamanohara, while an innocent Tama will get there in an instant. This sounds a lot, a lot like Catholic purgatory. The similarities do not end there. The purifying fires of purgatory might be the fire of God the Creator himself. Comparably, the Shinto creator goddess and death angel Izanami gave birth to a fire god who is revered as a purificatory agent. There is overlap, but not too much, I won't dwell on it. For now, purification in the Shinto creation myth will play a bigger role towards the end of this video. Now a quick look at Buddhism. Just like the church, so does Buddhism teach that it is our unhealthy attachments to things within the universe that lead us to hell or purgatory. The term purgatory even appears in Buddhist scriptures. What is nowadays often called Buddhist hell is a place of temporal punishment for one's own purification. And because of that similarity, early translators called it purgatory. In this regard, the Japanese and the Western mindsets are quite similar. If the developers wanted to get purgatory right, there is no doubt they could. And now, with all of that out of the way, let me finally return to Laura's letter. Mary asking Laura to give James a chance makes much more sense if we take everything that we have learned so far into account. The letter was written by Mary, a saint in heaven. The letter was given to Rachel, a higher saint in heaven, though it is addressed to Laura. Laura is an angel temporarily punishing James for his sins with the goal of James's conversion and salvation. Thus, James must be one of the poor souls in purgatory. So Mary's plea to give him a chance is a form of intercessory prayer from Mary with additional help from her patron Saint Rachel. The joint efforts of two saints, intercessory prayer to an angel who's taking care of the poor souls in purgatory, a prayer on behalf of a particular poor soul, namely James. A prayer with the intent that the angel may have mercy on James. That Mary would ask for the additional intercession of a saint who is held in such high regard can be seen as a sign of the severity of James's sin, even if Mary forgives James. It could be argued that the letters found throughout the game are representations of the intercessory prayers themselves. And not only from Mary. The memos from the Brookhaven director are a sort of intercessory prayer as well. His first memo, which gives James directions to progress, utilizes imagery which is quite similar to the biblical parable of Lazarus and the rich man, which can be read as poor souls in purgatory yearning for help and the intercession of saints to the dead or to the living. His second memo, the letter, not only gives James more directions, but 
it even is addressed to James directly. If you do not wish to stop, James, I pray to the Lord to have mercy on your eternal soul. It is not even trying to be subtle. This directly is intercessory prayer, albeit maybe not from a saint, but from one poor soul in purgatory to another, which the church teaches to be a possibility. Again, compare the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Another recurring theme in this letter is the abyss, as it states that a part of the abyss is in the old society, the key to which is found under the statue of a martyr. That part of the abyss which James would find in the old society can be expected to be a reference to the prison section of the game. What the prison has to do with martyrdom and the abyss of the dead, well that will become clear in a few minutes, and it leads us right back to where we were, namely the theme of James seeking forgiveness from Mary, a theme which actually appears in the prison, and not just anywhere in the prison, but in a very specific cell where we find the tablet called the Oppressor, which is generally assumed to represent James and Mary, and how James is seeking forgiveness from Mary. If what we find in this cell does indeed relate to James seeking forgiveness for his sin, then that explains one tiny detail which can be missed so easily. Heck, I never saw it until I played the enhanced mod at 1080p. You can imagine that I was quite surprised to find James's own cell plastered with images of the Stations of the Cross, depicting the Passion of Christ. This is where he's smuggling in Jesus well, up yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm I not you, unconscious of that. Well, James is obviously not Jesus, but every Christian is called to imitate and identify not as, but with Christ, also in his sufferings. So how do the Stations of the Cross relate to James and his journey? The Stations of the Cross are, in more than one sense, all about purgatory. Albeit found in some Anglican churches as well, they are a specifically Catholic tradition, also including some traditional embellishments of the biblical story. Traditionally, there tend to be 14 stations, only 5 of which can be found in the prison cell. Please allow me to dive into each one of these stations as I can identify them and let me apply them to what's going on in the game. First image. Station 2. Jesus takes up and carries his cross. To take up and carry your cross has become a well-known metaphor. It means that you cope with a burden, that you accept that you will have to handle a challenging situation and endure the difficulties which are thrown your way. It further means that you won't let the hardships stop you from trying to do the right thing, even if it means that you will have to suffer for it. Be it in this life or in the next, purgatory means to pick up your own cross and endure a bit of suffering through and from which you can grow in order to merit forgiveness and salvation. A process perfectly illustrated not only by the Stations of the Cross, but also by what James is going through. James's entire journey could be seen as him carrying his cross, and the moment he took this cross of his up was the moment he came to Silent Hill. Next image. Probably Station 3, 7 or 9. Jesus falls under the weight of his cross and gets flogged. Flogging is a very simple symbol for punishment. A biblical metaphor for purgative temporal punishment has the Lord scourging his followers for their own good, a warning from God. In Buddhism, those who neglect the God's warnings and then suffer in hell are being punished by hell guards. And here, the Kami Pyramid Head fulfills both of these purposes for James. I was weak. That's why I needed you. 
needed someone to punish me for my sins. Too weak to carry his cross on his own, and that's when he confronts his no longer needed helper and punisher, his guide and his flagellator, his guardian and scourger. Going through suffering can have a purgative aspect to it. It can make you tougher and stronger, but if it relates to a sin or a guilt of yours, then it also can teach you something which makes you more deserving of forgiveness. With Mary and James, this culminates in the scenes at the end where James speaks to Mary on her deathbed talking about what he has done and showing varying degrees of remorse, earning varying degrees of forgiveness from Mary. In one of the endings, James asks for forgiveness, prompting Mary to say, You killed me, and you're suffering for it. It's enough, James. In other words, James's suffering shall suffice. It almost sounds poetic. Next image. Station 10. Jesus is stripped of his clothes. James is never literally stripped of his clothes. No character in the game ever is. But metaphorically speaking, being stripped of one's clothes means that the naked truth about somebody is being revealed, that someone's shame has been let bare so that everyone can see what you're usually hiding. That's quite fitting for James. Towards the end of the game, the shameful truth about him is revealed to both him and Laura, or so it seems. True is even the title of this scene's background music. But it is all throughout the game that the town, if you will, is trying to communicate the truth to James by conjuring up images, events, or projecting characters even some characters, which tell James outright that they know the truth about him. The town trying to reveal the naked truth about James is a constant theme. Being stripped of one's clothes is also an act of humiliation. Humiliation can be a gruesome thing, or it can take away your pride, make you more grounded. Masahiro Ito said that Pyramid Head is the guardian to keep James being only human. In other words, his punishments keep James grounded by humiliating him in a purgative manner. Humiliation and confrontation with the shameful truth both are part of the purgatorial sufferings. Next image, Station 12, Jesus dies on the cross. Now we get to the crux of the matter. Different denominations have different interpretations regarding the crucifixion, but they all agree on one thing, that Christ died for our sins. Somehow, the crucifixion was what made it possible for all of mankind that their sins be taken away, that forgiveness, absolution and salvation could be extended to mankind, that the gates to heaven would be open to everyone, even if not everyone may choose to enter. How exactly all of that worked? That's been a debate for almost two millennia now. But let me focus on one of my favorite theories from the early church. The harrowing of hell. Not actually hell. In the early church, it was not uncommon to believe that when Christ died on the cross, he descended into Hades, where he flooded the underworld with his divine light and enabled people to find their way into heaven. In other words, Christ banished the limbo of the fathers of old and installed purgatory in its stead. The earliest evidence of that theory which I know is in AD 160 in the homily on the Holy Saturday by Saint Melita of Sardis. You know what's interesting? He calls the underworld prison and the dead residing there he calls prisoners. Circa 20 years later, a possible conflation of Bible verses by Church Father Saint Irenaeus shows that he too considered Christ's biblically mentioned preaching to the spirits in quote-unquote prison as a descent into the underworld. 
A few decades later, Church Father Tertullian outright says that he and his fellow believers understand the prison pointed out in the Gospel to be Hades, among other mentions. In one chapter of the same work, he even makes explicit reference to the teaching of Christ's descent into the underworld right before calling that underworld prison. Even a few decades before Christianity, the poet Virgil had already described Hades as a dark place of purgative temporary suffering, and he too called it a prison. I'll get back to Virgil and Greco-Roman mythology later in this video. Anyway, the early church called the temporary realm of the dead a prison, and they taught that Christ went down into that prison. At this point, the game is just beating us over the head with a club, asking us, Did you get it already? But how do I get into that prison complex? Oh wait, I've got a key. Let's see. Tis doubt which leadeth thee to purga what became of subtlety. And as James is going down into the prison, we hear this sound. Could it be, as many think, a ship's horn? Or is it the distorted song of a whale? Just listen to this sample's reprise later in the prison-themed labyrinth. Industrial whale singing. But why would it be a whale? If James's descent into the prison echoes Christ's descent into Hades at the crucifixion, note that the crucifixion is associated with what Christ himself announced as the sign of Jonah. The book of Jonah is commonly read as a story about the prophet Jonah spending three days and three nights in the belly of a whale in order to be cleansed of his sin. However, the text also indicates that Jonah spent this time in Sheol, Hades, the underworld prison. What we hear is an echo of Jonah's whale as James himself descends into the belly of the whale, echoing the sign of Jonah, echoing the descent of Christ into purgatory. So, not only is James going down into a prison hidden away in impossible space deep down below the surface of the earth, but it even is explicitly associated with purgatory. And to top it all off, here in this very cell in which James finds the tablet of the oppressor, finds the stations of the cross, is confronted with his own purgatorial suffering and temporal punishments, well what happens if he tries to leave the prison cell? The gate is shut. James himself becomes a prisoner. Early church code for those in Hades or Purgatory. Though it is temporal punishment, only for a little while has he suffered this imprisonment. Okay, but secular Japanese people wouldn't have a clue about early Christianity's notion of the underworld as a prison, right? Well, except in the Japanese city of Nagoya there used to be, or maybe still is, a restaurant themed like a Christian chapel, but with a prison-themed section one floor below. So Christians calling the lower regions a prison even made it into mundane Japanese pop culture. But how come? Well, before Japan got to know this concept from Christianity, they already knew it from their very own culture. Buddhist descriptions of hell repeatedly describe it as a prison, so much so that the Japanese word for it is Jigoku, which literally means underground prison. So technically, a Japanese Buddhist lens alone could suffice to explain this prison section. But what about Christians? For Japanese Christians, Jigoku means eternal hell, so how do they call purgatory? Rengoku, refinement prison. So they call it a prison either way. And can a Japanese Buddhist lens alone explain the objective fact that there are explicit Christian references to the stations of the cross in what seems to be James's own prison cell? No, it can't. 
So we need a Christian perspective as well to make sense of these references, to make sense of the Stations of the Cross and Christ dying on it. The crucifixion is also reenacted in baptism, which symbolizes Christ's descent into Hades through the immersion in water. James will have its own baptism in the in water ending, but I'll explain the endings in a later part of this video. For now, back to the prison's crucifixion symbols. Ancient Bible translations like the Gothic Wulfila Bible called the cross Galga, a gallows tree, so maybe even the gallows in the prison themed areas hint at the cross. Further hints at the crucifixion can be found in the prison lobby, in the entrance area, where James finds three paintings in a row. First, crimson and white banquet for the gods. These colors resemble the wine and the host during Holy Communion, so this painting may stand for the Last Supper. Second painting, death by skewering. The execution of criminals with a torture device, that is exactly what the ancient Roman practice of crucifixion was. On to the third and last painting, Toluca Prison Camp. As has been established already, the prison stands for purgatory, so this picture needs no further explanation. Note that only minutes later James will find and use the aforementioned purgatory key. These three pictures on the wall may very well represent the final hours of Christ, his death by crucifixion and his descent into Hades to install purgatory. The prison lobby contains one more possible hint at the crucifixion, which I like, but it's unlikely, far-fetched to say the least. Still, it fits together, so please let me explain. Premise A. Certain scholars think that Christ was born, or conceived, on September 11th in 3 BC due to a Bible passage matching up with an astronomical constellation on that date. Premise B. The Talmudic theory of integral age asserts that the prophets died on the same dates as their birth or conception, and some Christians have applied this idea to Christ as well. Conclusion. The crucifixion could theoretically have taken place on September 11th. And September 11th is mentioned the moment James enters the prison lobby. Side note, that's kinda awkward in a game released only two weeks after 9-11. <clears throat> now, do I really believe that the developers had this in mind? No, most probably not. But even without this frankly charming but unlikely hypothesis, the prison just offers so many hints at the installation of purgatory through the crucifixion. The whale singing, for example, hinting at the sign of Jonah, possibly even the date of September 11th, and the gallows. The three paintings hinting at the last hours of Christ and the installation of purgatory, right after which we find the purgatory key, which opens the gate to the prison itself, a metaphor for the underworld into which Christ descended during the crucifixion to install purgatory. And all of this is leading up to James finding his own prison cell walls plastered with the Stations of the Cross, allowing for this whole crucifixion-centered interpretation. So the entire prison section begins with an overarching theme of crucifixion. And this is very much in line with Buddhism, where the list of punishments in purgatory begins with what has been translated as the fivefold crucifixion. Crucifixion is also implied in the final boss fight against Maria, who appears as an upside-down crucified nun or Virgin Mary. Which leads us to the last of these images which we can find in James's prison cell, namely Station 13. Jesus is taken down from the cross, also known as Pieta. This famous image shows Virgin Mary holding her dad's son Jesus in her lap, lamenting his death with pity and with piety, thus Pieta. This image of the Virgin Mary here 
may represent her namesake in the game, James's very own Mary. More specifically, it might represent James's wish to have Mary save him, which matches the tablet of the oppressor found in the same cell. James gets his wish, but what he gets is twofold, as it is actualized through both Mary and Maria. Let me explain. There is one more image in James's prison cell, which might actually be connected to this image of the Pieta. Very, very hidden in the back of the cell, there is a framed image of a praying girl in an ancient religiously conservative garment. Maybe the young Virgin Mary? Very well possible, considering that the garments in both of these images are very similar, implying that it might be the same person. However, the girl also bears a striking resemblance to Laura, who, as you may recall, is dressed in the traditional colors of the Virgin Mary. Or, as the Japanese would call her, Sebo Maria. Virgin Maria. This might be a good opportunity to expand upon my previously explained theory that Laura is Pyramid Head. Remember how James ran after Pyramid Head but ran into Laura? Well, what happens next? Laura accuses James of not having loved Mary anyway and runs off. James, implicitly following Laura, continues on his path and only moments later he runs into Maria, who looks kind of familiar. On the one hand, with her blonde hair, she looks as if James had projected himself onto an image of his brown-eyed brunette wife. Almost like his young young anima, an idealized but judgmental and punishing image of a beloved woman stylized after one's own mind. On the other hand, and more relevant to this theory, Maria, albeit clothed in the crimson color of Pyramid Head, looks like a grown-up version of Laura. If Laura and Pyramid Head are the as above so below of a chiastic pyramid, then Maria represents the chiastic climax, sharing similarities with both. And her similarity with Laura would have been even more obvious earlier on in development, when Maria wore the same colors as Laura. I suppose that would have made the connection a little bit too obvious, but it leaves no doubt in my mind that Maria is really meant to look like an adult Laura. And Laura looks like a little girly version of James. Like a mini-anima. A mini-anima. Sounds kind of funny. So, are we dealing with part of James's psyche or with an angel? Well, both. Just like in Jacob's Ladder, James finds angels and demons in his own soul as biblical archetypes at the moment of his death. The punishing angel who is Pyramid Head and who is Laura is also Maria. Right after accusing James of not having loved Mary, this angel turns into Maria in order to test James and his love for Mary. Maria even says, or maybe you've hated her. Another odd line that seems to come out of nowhere but makes perfect sense if she is indeed that same angel continuing the discussion where Laura had left off. Akin to the spatial relation between Laura and Pyramid Head in the apartment building, a similar conclusion can be drawn regarding Laura and Maria. Maria lies down in the hospital room S3, where after Laura is found in C2, and both rooms overlap on the map. On a side note, Maria and Laura never appear together. Even in front of Brookhaven, the editing goes out of its way to make sure they're never together on screen. It is not until the second half, the deeper dream state, that Maria will share some screen time with the angel, albeit as Pyramid Head. But 
It is only in that second half that this angelic entity is also revealed to have the capacity for multi-location, often associated with saints and angels. So, Maria and the two pyramid heads here could very well be one and the same being multi-locating in different forms at once. The angel who is taking care of him is taking the image of James's punishing anima from his mind to take on its form. This is one way in which a certain type of Maria, as in Sebo Maria, is taking care of James. But at the same time, his actual Mary really does try to save him. And indeed she does, which solves what could otherwise be a huge problem. As has been established, those in purgatory will go to heaven, but the game does imply that James might not go to heaven. The in water ending and the second message in Neely's bar imply that the story might not end well for him, which would conflict with James being in purgatory, which must lead to heaven. However, there is a solution, namely, that Mary forgives James. I will explain. The multiple endings may imply one of two things. Either James is stuck in a loop, not a never-ending loop, mind you, because the loop will be broken at some point. Or maybe we are dealing with a multiple worlds kind of setting, where each ending represents one possible world. However, in the leave ending, Mary forgives James. Her positive forgiveness in that world might overwrite the mere lack of forgiveness in all the other possible worlds. Or it is the action which breaks the cycle. So, Station 13, the Pieta, is a perfect representation of James's flight into Mary's arms which draw him out of purgatory and up into heaven. If James's journey is one through purgatory drawing parallels to the Stations of the Cross, then it is noteworthy that the Stations of the Cross only depict the death of Christ. What is not included is the aftermath the Resurrection and the Ascension. The Resurrection was Christ's ascent from the Underworld, his return from the Realm of the Dead, which is celebrated on Easter. This is followed by the Ascension, which is when he went up into Heaven. This theme of ascent from the Underworld and up into Heaven is also present in the aftermath of James's prison term. If the prison and the still prison-themed labyrinth are purgatory, then James's boat ride could be a symbol for James embarking on a journey across the purgatorial Acheron out of Hades and towards Anamnesis. In Greek mythology, which undoubtedly had some influence on the Bible's worldviews, Acheron was a lake in Hades, a place of healing, not a place of punishment cleansing and purging the sins of humans. In other words, purgatory. According to Plato, the dead who had lived a mediocre life were given a boat to traverse that lake, a concept familiar to the Japanese worldview, where the dead have to cross the river Sanzu before they can attain bliss and reincarnate, escaping hell, just like crossing Acheron leads out of Hades. The Greek word Hades, or Hades, literally means unseen, meaning the hidden invisible place of darkness, where there is no knowledge nor wisdom and no understanding. Thus, leaving Hades implies the regaining of knowledge and understanding, which Plato called anamnesis. Plato taught that at the end of their journey through the underworld, the dead would regain their knowledge of ideas and basic truths needed for life, refreshing their instincts before they would reincarnate. That's anamnesis. 
James's own anamnesis starts after he has killed Eddie, implied by the emphasis in his utterance regarding Mary's death, and by the vanishing of the writing on Mary's letter. The illusion is fading, his knowledge is slowly returning, but he is not quite there yet. So, in order to actually get there, James rows across the lake, akin to the purifying lake of Acheron, straight to the final area, the hotel on the other side of the lake, where James leaves the realm of unseeing, now seeing, fittingly named Lake View Hotel. The hotel stands for the anamnesis at the end of the journey through the underworld, the place where James anamnetically regains his knowledge. This idea that the hotel might symbolize anamnesis from Greek philosophy might be hinted at by one of the pictures hanging in its lobby. On one side of the hall there is a picture of the hotel itself. On the other side, there is the exact same picture, but with a photo of some bearded guy next to whom there are Greek letters. The low resolution makes them hard to read, especially the second word. But the first word is pretty clearly readable, and it says Eroche, which to my knowledge means nothing, it's not actually a word. I assume that some Japanese person wrongly memorized a Greek word in katakana syllables. E ruche should actually mean erche, which is a command telling you to start doing something. Both words are brief, ending on epsilon, so I suppose that both are imperatives. Guessing the second word, I have come up with a range of interpretations, some of which would perfectly fit the idea of an eye-opening, purgatorial cleansing, or that James has to start praying for Mary's intercession. The most likely interpretation, I think, is Erche Lue, roughly translating to the command, start to atone. So let me repeat. We have an image of the hotel associated with Greek writing, like Greek philosophy, telling us to start to atone, or to start cleansing ourselves so that we can see. That's the Greek philosophy of anamnesis. Back to Erchelue. It also can mean to start making amends with the goal of redemption. A theme not only befitting James's journey in general, but especially my interpretation of the multiple endings, which we will get to in a few minutes. Note, the primary meaning of ancient Greek Leo is not necessarily to atone, but to release, as in freeing someone from prison, for example. In the Bible, it occurs multiple times in the context of forgiving one's sins, namely the phrase to bind and lose. In a similar sense, luo also means to dissolve or untie, as if to untie a knot. Interestingly, Buddhism describes the self as consisting of several internal knots, knots of anger and hatred and other personal issues. To dissolve into nirvana, you need to untie these knots within yourself. This idea of atonement through the untying of something sinful within is shared by East and West. Buddhists also say that you have to untie these knots one by one. By untying the one right in front of you, you learn how to untie the next one. It's a learning process of gaining more understanding and starting to see, not unlike anamnesis. The aforementioned dissolution being the enlightenment of nirvana is of additional interest here because nirvana is also speculated to mean unbinding, the total unbinding parinirvana being equivalent with the act of dying. Dying with enlightenment. Complete understanding in the dream of death.
often people have dreams, for example. Some of you have had this dream, I suspect. You'll dream that you're in a house that you know well, and all of a sudden you discover a new room, or a set of new rooms, or maybe a set of rooms in the basement. And often the rooms are, are, are not well organized, and they're full of water. Those are very common things. And what that means is that you've broken through the constraints of your conscious self-understanding to a new domain of, of possibility, but a new domain that needs a tremendous amount of work. It says, well, here's a new part of you, but it's not well developed. There's, there's, it's flooded. It's flooded with chaos, essentially. And it's water, I think, partly, because chaos is not only what you fall into when you're not expecting it, but it's also the unknown that you confront forthrightly and generate new things out of. Although primarily associated with water, the hotel is also associated with mountains and fire. Filled with mountain paintings from top to bottom, the hotel is on fire both in the cutscene with Angela and in the drawing Burning Man found earlier in the prison. Dante conceptualized purgatory as a mountain, but more importantly, in the Bible, mountains and fire combined signify a spiritual encounter with God, where new information is being learned. So, the hotel's association with mountains and fire perfectly illustrates it being a purgatorial place of divine encounters where James has a chance to gain knowledge and understanding. Shortly after regaining his knowledge in the hotel, James sees Angela walk up her very own stairway to heaven through the flames of her very own purgatory. Flames which James himself possibly cannot even see, considering that his only reaction to them is to casually comment on the temperature in the room. It's hot as hell in here. Not how I would react if I were surrounded by flames. You see it too. No, he didn't actually say that. All he said was, it's hot as hell in here. Hot as hell. How fitting for it is but a mere comparison to the flames of hell. Remember, even purgatory might feel and seem like hell, although it is quite the opposite. These purgatorial flames which have purified Angela keep James from going up that same stairway to heaven. Because it is not his stairway to heaven and not his purifying flames. Before James himself can finally ascend from Hades, he must face his sin and fight his fears. Once James has beaten the two pyramid heads, finished off the first two manifestations of this punishing angel, we get Easter eggs. Literal Easter eggs. I know it sounds like I'm joking, but I'm dead serious. Back from the dead serious. In order to use up all the uneaten eggs which atheist chickens were busy laying while theist Christians were busy abstaining from eggs during Lent, Easter eggs came to be used to celebrate Christ's resurrection from the dead on Easter. And to symbolize the blood of Christ shed for our sins, Easter eggs have traditionally been, and still are, painted red. I've always wondered why, why is Silent Hill giving me easter eggs, literal easter eggs. But now that I know about the game itself drawing a comparison between James's journey of suffering and the Stations of the Cross, after which would follow the resurrection at Easter, these red eggs make perfect sense. Just like Christ ascended from the underworld, these eggs now represent James's own ascent from the underworld. These eggs are a symbol of freedom and a key, literal keys, into freedom, opening the gates of Hades which shall not prevail against the church, at the core of which is the resurrection at Easter. When the game began, James went down a straight stairway, went along a winding path, opened the cemetery gates, and thus set foot on the fields of the dead, 
which represent the realm of the dead, purgatory or Hades. Now that the game draws to a close, James uses the symbol of resurrection, of new life, to open the gates of Hades and step outside this larger prison of purgatory. He walks along a straight path, walks up a winding stairway, and finishes off Maria, the third and final manifestation of the angel who is testing him. And once this test is over, the game finally ends. And if it ends well for James, it ends with a view across the same cemetery from the start. In the leave ending, we see James walking across the cemetery together with Laura. As I have mentioned before, I do not think that this path will literally lead him back to his car. I mean, what, is he going to drive off and have a brand new life with his brand new adoptive daughter? That's never gonna work out. Rather, considering everything that I have presented over the course of this video, the most logical interpretation of this scene might just be that James is going to heaven. With a little chapel nearby, just out of screen, James is walking among the dead, being led by a psychopomp, an angel who leads the dead to bring them to their final destination. Laura is that psychopomp, and she fulfills that role by leading James to the cemetery gates, and not just cemetery gates. If, by going from the outside in, James, be it symbolic or not, entered the underworld through these gates, then now, by going from the inside out, James is leaving the underworld through these same gates. These are now the gates to heaven. And not only does this angel lead the way, but James eventually takes the lead, stepping through these gates by himself, signifying that James is indeed ready for heaven. The conclusion that James goes to heaven can also be drawn from comparing the parallels between Silent Hill 2 and another story which you may have heard of. In Dante Alighieri's La Commedia, the protagonist Dante is on a journey through and out of the underworld, accompanied and guided by his very own psychopomps, first the poet Virgil, then the fair maiden Beatrice, masculine and feminine. Virgil leads Dante through Inferno up to Purgatorio, the lower regions. Beatrice leads Dante from Purgatorio up to Paradiso, the higher regions. Both psychopomps symbolize the self, like higher self and lower self. Virgil stands for the self because Dante wanted to be like this famous poet. Beatrice is a symbol of the self against whom sin must be overcome. Accordingly, Jungian scholars identify her as Dante's anima, to which Virgil might be the animus counterpart. As you may recall, Laura is stylized as a bit of a mini-anima of James as well, and some people have found reason to believe that Pyramid Head is actually James in some way, which, might I add, would fit perfectly well with the Ubitsume ring finger. I say he's the Red Thread's deity, but even if he is, that deity could easily take on a form inspired by James to hold up a mirror to him. So, both Pyramid Head and Laura might represent the self, masculine lower self, and feminine higher self. And in La Commedia, it is the feminine higher self Beatrice who eventually leads Dante out of purgatory and up into heaven, just like here in the game, where it is the feminine higher self Laura, whom we can consequently conclude to be leading James out of purgatory and up into heaven. If the game parallels La Commedia on purpose, we can expect it to parallel its end goal. Dante's Beatrice has another and more widely known aspect to her character, namely that of being Dante's beloved. 
a beloved woman in pursuit of whom the protagonist enters a city of pain and goes through purgatory, and she is a saint in heaven, where, as La Commedia explicitly states twice, she sits together with the ancient matriarch Rachel. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Not only is this game's Mary equally accompanied by that very same Rachel of old, as I have shown, but the author's reason to place Beatrice at Rachel's side was that he saw his own beloved Beatrice as a counterpart to Rachel, just like this game's Mary, as I have shown, is a counterpart to Rachel as well. So, Mary is to James what Beatrice is to Dante. Thus, it follows that, just like Dante is brought to heaven by the intercession and clemency of his beloved Beatrice, so does the intercession and clemency of James's beloved Mary play a role in bringing him to heaven. Two more noteworthy parallels between Silent Hill 2 and La Commedia are the protagonist's crossing of Acheron and or other infernal bodies of water in a boat, and that the whole story begins with the protagonist walking through a forest which leads him to the entry gate of Hades. The leave ending is the one ending which puts into focus all these elements which parallel the beginning of La Commedia, reminding us of Dante's journey and that James is on the same path, a path towards heaven. I am sure there are many more similarities between La Commedia and Silent Hill 2. Who knows, maybe enough for another two hour video. But I have made my point, and it's time to move on to the final chapter of this video, discussing the game's multiple endings and James's journey of understanding. As I have mentioned, the game's multiple endings may be hinting at James going through different iterations of a purgatorial loop, a cycle which only Mary's forgiveness can break putting an end to this dream of death. Which leads me back to something that I have only displayed in a side note in the first chapter of this video, but which becomes much more relevant now. Dreams are built from rearranged memories, serving as a mechanism for stress relief and, more importantly, the communication of unconscious knowledge. In other words, one's soul is actively trying to achieve understanding and salvation. What a dying man's dream of death has to do with salvation through understanding leads us back to another thing which was mentioned in the first chapter, though now we can see it in a new context and a new light. I understand now. It's time to end this nightmare. Yes, it's time to end this nightmare, because this dying man's dream of death draws to a close, but only here in the leave ending where Mary's forgiveness will break his purgatorial cycle. But James also says, I understand now. James's regained understanding at the end of his dream's journey is referring to his anamnesis, and only here in the leave ending, as it is here where James will go to heaven, will his anamnesis be complete. Because, although this is not the only ending in which James's understanding is being addressed, akin to the aforementioned Buddhist teaching of the self consisting of sinful knots which have to be untied in the right order, there actually seems to be a chronological order to the game's proper endings as well. If they are put in the right order, the four endings tell a story of a journey from invincible ignorance towards salvatory understanding, ending in redemption through forgiveness. First, in the Maria ending, in which James doesn't seem to have learned anything, James keeps mistaking the angel for Mary, not recognizing her until after the fight, but he cannot yet fully grasp it. That wasn't Mary. Mary's gone. That was just something I... Maria? And this manifestation tells James that, since the angel has not been his victim, 
The angel is not the one who can give James the forgiveness he should be seeking. That's why you needed this Maria person? James, do you really think I could ever forgive you for what you did? Also note that James admits to having felt hatred for Mary, but he says it in such a casual and careless manner. It's true. I may have had some of those feelings. It was a long three years. I was tired. This doesn't sound like remorse. It sounds like emotional detachment. Callous and careless, like he's got no regrets and no contrition whatsoever. Maybe he has got some issues, maybe he is depressed, or maybe he just doesn't care. Don't chuck it up to bad voice acting. Guys see he doesn't usually talk like that. And the tone will change in the next few endings. In the next iteration, the rebirth ending, James will, after having eloped with Maria in the previous ending, immediately recognize her and break up with her. Maria, I'm finished with you. The angel then explicates that James does not yet understand. Mary's dead. Don't you understand? She's not coming back. Now that James has been prompted to understand, he is silent at first, but then concludes that without Mary, he cannot go on, which he says twice, and that without her, he can't live. Without Mary, I just can't go on. But without you, I just can't go on. I can't live without you, Mary. James is not saying that he wants to resurrect Mary but that it depends on Mary and her forgiveness whether he can go on with his life. The seed of the leave ending's goal has been planted, and he is starting to pray to her, asking for her intercession. And let me assure you, it is not just my own wishful thinking that this ending has to do with prayer. The song, which is playing during this ending's credits, is an actual 18th century prayer about dying and giving one's soul to God. So, it fits perfectly well that in this particular scene, James is moving towards a church, symbolic of him turning to the Heavenly Council and turning to them in prayer. Catholic prayer to the saints is not just in theory, but also in practice compatible with Japanese ancestor veneration, where ancestors receive prayers for their intercession. These ancestors are in the state of Gokuraku Ojo, commonly translated as either joyful rebirth, like the title of this ending, or peaceful death. Peaceful. The state that Mary is in. Mary, you look so peaceful. Forgive me for waking you. Note that we can see Mary lying in the boat and that she is, metaphorically speaking, asleep, not yet awake. Also note that James's voice is a bit more emotional than it was in the previous ending, closer to Guy see his natural voice too, but it is still lacking in contrition. James ends on stating that the old gods are able to grant power to defy even death. Make no mistake, we're not dealing with Lovecraftian zombies here, rather James's words are paraphrasing the Paschal Troparion from ancient Christianity. And we know already that the game itself draws a direct connection between Christian tradition and James's seeking of Mary's forgiveness. Biblical matters may also be hinted at in the books and items one has to collect to achieve this ending. So it would make sense that the rebirth ending is really about James starting to understand that he must reach out 
for Mary's saintly intercession. Next is the in watcher ending. In this iteration, James will say twice that he understands. Now I understand. The problem is, you're not Mary. Now I understand. The real reason I came to this town. I wonder, what was I afraid of? Without you, Mary, I've got nothing. By now, James has come to understand that the angel is not Mary, that only Mary can forgive him, and that this is what he has entered purgatory for. Without her, he's got nothing. Hinting at the necessity of her intercession and forgiveness for him to attain salvation. This is the first time that the ending will contain the scene where James is talking to Mary on her deathbed. In the rebirth ending where Mary was seen asleep, James said that he would have to wake her. Now we see her lying in her bed, turning her head around, signifying that she is waking up just now. The picture of this scene with her lying in her deathbed had an incomplete reconstruction foreshadowed in the rebirth ending. This reconstruction is now complete. What is not yet complete though is James's contrition. James must attain perfect contrition, but it's not yet perfect. Although remorseful, James still sounds half-hearted. He does not yet take full responsibility for his actions, only admitting that part of him hated Mary. Forgive me. That's why I did it, honey. I just couldn't watch you suffer. <laughs> no. That's not the whole truth. You also said that you didn't want to die. The truth is, part of me hated you for taking away my life. But he is getting there, slowly but surely. Only once he will have attained perfect contrition will he have merited forgiveness. Instead, Mary will, for now, only highlight the sufficiency of James's purgatorial suffering so that he can attain her forgiveness. You kill me, and you're suffering for it. It's enough, James. Right after which, James lets go of his fear of suffering and plunges himself right into the lake, immersing himself as if to receive a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As I have pointed out earlier already, baptism is a ritual which uses immersion in water for the reenactment of the Creator God, Christ, descending and ascending from the underworld to free the dead. Similarly, the Shinto ritual Misogi uses immersion in water for the reenactment of the creator god Izanagi descending and ascending from the underworld to search for his dead wife. Traditional references to the wife can be found in Misogi-related literature, and they bear similarities to the themes of Silent Hill 2. One passage reads, clean precious riverbed, in it do I purify myself for my wife's sake. That is exactly what James is doing in the lake. He even invokes Mary just before he immerses himself in water. The other passage is even more interesting. It says, I have not met my wife for a long time. Another similarity to Sound Hill 2 is how the dead wife asked her husband to not look at her because of how ugly she had become. I'm disgusting. Look like a monster. Well, what are you looking at? Get the hell out of here! But he looked anyway, and he could not bear the sight of her. 
I think it's safe to say that Silent Hill 2 hints at Misogi and the mythology behind it. But is it only Misogi or is it also Baptism? It is very common to compare Baptism to Misogi and vice versa, which makes it quite likely that the two concepts got merged and conflated here, making it impossible to draw a clear distinction. But as we have learned from James's own prison cell being themed with the death of Christ, that very event which is reenacted in baptism, we should focus on the baptismal connotations. And scripturally, baptism is directly connected to the forgiveness of sins which James is seeking and to the role which the in water ending seems to be playing in the bigger context of the four endings. So, let's have a scriptural look at baptism. The word baptism actually means immersion in water, biblically connected to repentance, or to use the Greek New Testament language for repentance, metanoia, which literally means turning around, resulting in forgiveness. The Bible's word for which literally means letting someone leave. Thus, this immersion or baptism leads to the forgiveness of the leave ending, in which James's metanoia or turnaround can be felt by his choice of words. As much as his understanding in the in water ending was directed towards the past, why he came here, what he was afraid of, his understanding here in the leave ending is directed towards the immediate future, namely that this nightmare or death dream is about to end. This anamnetic turnaround is also hinted at in how he says that he understands. In the In Water ending, James said, Now I understand. But now in the Leave ending, he says, I understand now. James's understanding takes precedence now. The focus and the word order have been reversed, almost chiastically. Afterwards, we see James asking for Mary's forgiveness again. And this time, James will take full responsibility for his actions, admitting that not just part of him hated Mary, but that he hated Mary. And he will say it with such emotion and such suffering. It's the counter-opposite to his emotional detachment back in the Maria ending. James has attained perfect contrition. The truth is, I hated you. I wanted you out of the way. I wanted my life back. And this time, Mary won't focus on telling James to suffer, but instead saying, then why do you look so sad? She recognizes his perfect contrition. And she tells James, Please do something for me. Go on with your life. Go on and live. Which is exactly what James previously stated he could not do without Mary's involvement. So, Mary has sent him off to go on with his life and to do it not just for him, but also for her. So, it is only as an unselfish, altruistic act, together with Mary, that James can finally leave. And that is the meaning of the biblical word for forgiveness. Letting somebody go on with their life, letting them leave. And thus, the final ending is the leave ending. Let me be clear here, James is already dead. 
to go on with his life means that he is now free to continue his existence on a different non-purgatorial plane. From a Catholic angle, this must mean that he will now go to heaven, where he and Mary will be together. And, as I have shown before, it would probably be the same case in a Shinto worldview. Granted, from a Buddhist angle, reincarnation would be one more viable option. However, in the Buddhist mind, going to heaven is just reincarnation on a higher plane. Last but not least, there is one final thing to observe about these four endings, namely the lake and how it relates to James's journey of understanding. Remember, this lake is a symbol of Acheron, of anamnesis and thereby understanding. In the first ending, James looks at the lake in front of him. And then he ignores it. He is not yet willing to understand. In the second ending, James is moving not only towards a church, but also towards understanding. And fittingly, he is traveling on the lake. In the third ending, where James begins to actually understand, he is fully immersed by the lake, fully immersed by the waters of understanding. In the fourth and final ending, James can, as he is moving towards the pearly gates, finally leave the lake of understanding behind, both metaphorically and literally. So the endings do tell a story of James's journey from invincible ignorance towards salvatory understanding. Regarding all of this, consider this quote from the game's director and writer Takayashi Sato about the game's horror. I think there are two main factors that evoke fear. First, to see something beyond their understanding. Second, to see concealed their true self. Sure, this quote could be read in a solely secular light. But, from a spiritual angle, this statement implies that the game is about a journey of overcoming a lack of understanding towards a revelation of one's true self, which might not sound very Buddhist to some, but the Tibetan version of the Buddhist Mahaparinirvana Sutta reveals one of the Buddha's very last teachings to have been about the very real existence of the self. On this teaching of the true self, seemingly in conflict with the more prominent Buddhist notion that there supposedly is no such thing as a self, only a false illusory perception of it, the Japanese scholar of Buddhist studies Kosho Yamamoto commented that this true self is about the inner content of Nirvana. So, the game is all about overcoming a lack of understanding to find the true self, which means reaching nirvana, which in the Christian mind translates to understanding, leading to salvation and heaven. After the early Christians had picked up the concept of anamnesis, the medieval scholastic Thomas Aquinas argued that understanding plays an essential role in achieving the beatific vision, which means going to heaven and seeing God face to face. Aquinas argued that happiness results from understanding, when the mind resonates with truth and reality. The ultimate truth is the incomprehensible God which overwhelms the human's finite intellect, making God infinitely understandable. Imagine a moment of childlike awe from learning something new, but for all eternity, resulting in eternal happiness in heaven from infinite understanding. Just like James's journey ends with him approaching heaven because he understands now. This is by no means exclusive to Thomistic teaching, but also has a parallel in Buddhism, where eternal happiness is achieved by embracing the similarly incomprehensible emptiness of reality in order to move towards understanding the truth and eventually enter 
Nirvana. Yet another concept which Catholics and Buddhists have more or less in common, and thus possibly not too foreign to the Japanese developers. Eternal happiness from infinite understanding. That does indeed sound like a desirable prospect. I can agree with Aquinas and Buddhist philosophy that understanding will produce happiness if it is fully embraced, and that is the hardest part about it. In a way, this whole video could be seen as my own personal exercise in trying to gain understanding and thereby attain some peace. And it actually helped me. I started making this video at a time when, and because, I had a deep anxiety which kept me from finishing my own PhD thesis. A thesis about the Book of Jonah, which turned out to be a thesis about overcoming anxiety, ironically enough. Little did I know that this video would sit on my shelf for years as a personal side project, but it was exactly what I needed at the time. If it hadn't been for this video, I might never have been able to finish my PhD thesis. In writing this video, I had given myself a stage to playfully act out what I had to do and then translate this process onto a larger scale, which immensely helped me in overcoming that struggle. And this is really what the mind's process of understanding is all about. What dreams are about. And thus, what the story of Silent Hill 2 is about. I hope you've appreciated my little discourse. Thank you for watching.